It's interesting how music can connect memories and thoughts and, and emotions uh, of things that we've gone through, things we've experienced. And uh, I, I look back at my life, and um, I got saved at a youth group. I was a junior in high school when I professed faith in Christ. And to this day, I can remember songs we sang. And they hold a very special place in my heart. And it's interesting to think about the different ways songs have changed over the years. Um, back then, songs were a lot simpler, it seems. They were a lot more focused just on scripture. Um, and, and just even just certain thoughts. Um, I remember one song it was called, Jesus is Coming Back to Stay. And the lyrics were simple. Jesus is coming back to stay. Could be any time of day. Jesus is coming back, I know, because the Holy Bible tells me so. So praise the Lord, we're going to shout hallelujah, amen. Praise the Lord, Jesus is coming again. Simple, right? Really clear-cut and simple lyrics. But even as a non-believer, like I was going when I was 15, 16 years old, we would sing that song and it began to sort of burrow into my heart this thought like Jesus is coming back. You know, Jesus is going to come back. Um, and, and I remember then years later, uh, a youth pastor we had, a guy by the name of Reggie, who is this good old boy Southern Baptist Louisiana guy leading a bunch of Korean and Japanese kids, which is interesting. Um, but he, he made this statement once, and it was so great. He said, throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there's a thin red line. And, and that thin red line is just following the Messiah, following the Savior, and you have the fall, and then you have this anticipation. The Savior's coming. The Savior's coming. Then you get to, like, the New Testament, and it's like, he's here. He's here. And then he's died, resurrected, he goes away, and then it becomes, he's coming again. So from he's coming, he's here, he's coming again. And I think that sometimes we um, focus a lot on the coming. We focus on he's here, and we don't always anticipate his coming again. Um, as we start this message, I just want to say this. This is going to be pretty um, general because I'm trying to take a bunch of things that you could focus in on on one message or even divide it and, and really look at those passages and look at these topics and spend a lot of time on them. My goal with this is to get sort of a survey, taking like a 30,000-foot view the purpose of it being you go home and you talk about it with your family. You go home and mom and dad, even if you don't know the answers, it's okay. Work through it with your, your family. One of the greatest strengths we as parents can have is to look our children in the eye and say, I don't know. Let's find out together. Let's work through it together. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Revelation 19. We're picking up right after that passage that I asked Bob to read. And I asked him to read that because that was another song um, that we would sing, you know, and, and we would praise the Lord with. And I just love that passage. But it sets the stage. This marriage supper of the Lamb happens, and then you get to this Christ returning. It's called simply the return, the comeback. And I just want to pick up here. I'm just going to read this to you, 19, 11 to 21. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in, in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. I'm going to stop right here. This picture of Christ is, is amazing and beautiful and honestly terrifying. The picture we have here is not of the suffering servant. It's not of Christ coming and, and healing and things like that. He's come to make war. He's come to fight a battle. But you look at the way he's described, and it's interesting because he's described as already having won. It would be like this. It would be like if Michael Jordan, when the Bulls were winning all those championships, showed up on the court soaked in champagne smoking a cigar, and the game hasn't started yet, 
right? The, the story goes in 93 when Phoenix beat the Bulls in Chicago. They're on the plane back, and the team's kind of down, and he gets on the plane. He's got a cigar in his mouth, and he says, what's up, world champs? Right? He, he goes thinking, we're going to win. I'm packing one change of clothes. We're going to win the game, and we're coming back. We're done. The picture we have here of Christ is this. He's riding a white horse. The white horse was ridden by Roman conquerors down the Via Sacra. Okay? They would ride a white horse because the white horse represented power. It, was, it represented strength, purity, all these things. That was a very clear sign you won if you rode that horse. Secondly, his clothes are dipped in blood. People who won battles would dip their clothes in the blood of their enemies. Okay, it's like the champagne bath at the championship after the game. They would come in and their clothes would be soaked with blood. Not necessarily because they fought the battle, but because their army won. They conquered. So he's walking into this battle here already claiming, I won. This thing's done. The picture we have here, Jesus is not coming back just to be a nice guy. He's fighting a just war. He's righting wrongs. He is coming back. Believers have been undergoing tribulation and trial, hardship. We have suffered under sin. We pay the penalty of sin. We still will one day face death. We still are under that curse. Jesus comes to make it right. Behind him are the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. They ride into battle following this, this king who's got many diadems. You know, it's, it's different from the, the crowns that they describe in the Bible for us. These are like ruling crowns, okay? These aren't like the Olympic wreaths, the laurel wreaths they gave that, that are described for us. These are like authoritative crowns, kingdoms, rulership. John brings a full circle, right? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And here is his name, the Word of God. From his mouth comes this sharp sword. And, and there are so many things that are sort of allegorical or is it real. It doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, whether it be literal that a sword's coming from his mouth or allegorical that with a word he can defeat all of his enemies. The fact of the matter is, Christ is sovereign and he will rule the day. In the midst of this, the Antichrist, the, the, the false prophet, lead these armies, and they're all ready, and they're captured, they're taken, and Jesus goes before them, and that sword that comes from his mouth kills all the enemies. The false prophet, the, the Antichrist, are tossed into uh, the lake of burning fire, never to be seen again. Never to be seen again. Satan is bound for a thousand years. And you look at this picture, it's, it's kind of gruesome, where the angel calls all the birds, come feast on the bodies of the slain. We have a mighty Savior. We have a Savior who can save us from our own sin, who died, paid the penalty. But we also have a Savior who will return in power and in victory. We have to teach the whole counsel of God. We can't ignore this truth. He is coming back. You then go into the millennial reign and it's an interesting thing because we don't want to confuse the millennial reign with heaven, heaven coming down. This millennial reign, there's, there's going to be different things happening. Jesus will be on earth reigning and ruling. 
with his people, right? We have that. False prophet, uh, antichrist are in, in prison in the lake of fire. They're gone. Satan is imprisoned. But that at the end of the thousand years, he's freed. And he rallies people. He deceives people to follow him again. Now, now think about this. People have experienced a thousand years. No temptation, no sin. If there is sin, they have um, committed it, and it's probably been, judgment has been executed quickly. Jesus is just. But you have a situation where Satan is released, and he's able to deceive people, people who may have professed to be Christians at that point, and have turned and now follow Satan again. Think about a thousand years of experiencing peace, a thousand years of, of just ruling, and you get to see Christ face to face. You'll see him, and people are still turning away from him. People are still following after their own selfish, sinful desires when presented the opportunity when Satan is freed. And this is, this is so cool, okay? I, I, do you guys like um, Lord of the Rings? Okay. So I read Lord of the Rings the first time. I read it like four or five times. First time I read it was in middle school, okay? And pretty much I didn't really read it because I skipped all the poetry. I just blew past I'm like, this is so boring. And I would go straight to the battles, right? I'd read about the battle at Helm's Deep or... As Gilead or this or that or you know and I would just want to read about the fighting and all these wars and be like wow look at how powerful they are and they beat evil they defeated evil and good wins right second or third time started to appreciate more of the book and appreciate what was going on but this is one of those moments it's one of those battle moments okay so Satan rallies Gog and Magog, right? Gog is a, a, a leader and Magog represents a land. And so he rallies the, the, the people from the far reaches of the earth. They surround Jerusalem. They surround God's people. God sends fire down and it's over. There's a couple ways to look at it, right? They talk about how, is it like um, when the Israelites cross the Red Sea where there's a wall of fire and then it, it moves out and kills them? Or is it like Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down fire on them and brimstone and killed them all. Like it's not really clear, but, but the, the picture we have here, God fights the battle. God fights the war. We sit in the safety and security of, of Christ. And even though all these things are happening, all these people are gathered and the machines of war and everything that man could, could rally and bring against God, and God takes care of it in an instant. This is our God. Fire comes down from heaven and consumed them. And then this beautiful passage, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be torment, tormented day and night forever and ever. They won't be seen again. They won't be dealt with again. That's done. So we had Christ coming back. We have now the beast and, and uh, the, the false prophet and Satan himself judged, defeated. And now the stage is set for this beautiful descent of the new Jerusalem. And, and it's in this in-between, between when Satan is judged, Satan is, is in prison and he's gone forever now, and the descent of the New Jerusalem, you get this verse. It says this in Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's not until after the millennial kingdom you have this passage. Victory is won at this point. And what do we see now is the new Jerusalem descending from heaven. This thing is amazing, okay? John is with an angel, and the angel measures the city. He says it's 12,000 stadia cubed, okay? 12,000 stadia is about 1,400 miles. 
It's about the distance from here to Phoenix. Imagine a city that on one side is as long as that distance, from here to Phoenix, then deep, and then tall. How amazing is that? Just the sheer immensity and size of it. The wall, 144 cubits, whether it's height or, or depth. I think it's probably more depth because I can't imagine it's about 73 yards. That's about three quarters of a football field. Okay? This is the size of the New Jerusalem. And the size is impressive, but then you start reading the description. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. Jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysophrase, jacinth, and amethyst. Like, incredible, right? The, the, the supporting foundation. And then the 12 gates of the city are 12 pearls. Uh, most pearls are what, like that? How big are these pearls? And in, uh, in biblical times, pearls were extremely precious. Because you think about it, how do you get a pearl? You've got to dive. You don't have equipment like we have it now. These guys would have to hold their breath and go down and get these things. There was a lot of risk in getting a pearl. And now you've got these pearls that are the size of, to make gates out of? This is, this is even the best part, okay? There's no temple in the city. All right? No temple. Because God's the temple. Jesus is the temple. And you don't need light. Because God is the light. Jesus is the light. He's the lamp. And by these lights, by, by God's light, by Jesus' light, the nations will walk. And then you get this passage. I'm going to go down to chapter 22. And this description, I, I, I've thought about this passage, and I've thought, and you just close your eyes, okay? Like, it's better to try to use your imagination to picture this scene than it is to, like, just listen to it, okay? Just close your eyes and try to picture this, okay? Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Uh, if you've traveled, right, there's, there's famous roads you can go down, right? Like the, the Champs-Élysées in Paris, right? Um, and it's so funny, because like I was so excited to, to walk it with Kathy, and we walked it, and we finished. It's like, eh, I like Michigan Avenue better. Like, great, I could have just gone to Chicago and done that. But, like, you picture this and, and, and imagine what it's going to be like. And the true beauty, the true majesty, the true wonder of it all is that God will be there. It's that God will see you and you will see him face to face. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Folks, the reality is this. When we read about these things, when we read about Christ coming back, when we read about this incredible city we're going to be in, living in, when we read about 
the judgment that's going to come against Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet, when we, we think about these things, it's sort of like imagining where you're going to end up, okay? Like, when I think about it, I think about sports, okay? And as a coach, what's your goal? Your goal is always to win the championship. Your goal is always to, to, to win your last game type of thing, right? Just keep winning. That's the goal. Well, how do you get there? You practice. You, you play other games, right? If, if we were playing volleyball, you'd want to win state. But in order to win state, you've got to win the super sectional. In order to win the super sectional, you've got to win the sectional and then the regional. And you should probably try to win conference. And, and, you know, just having these markers of trying to get to where you want to be, this is where we want to be. This, this is where we want to end up with Christ. How do we get there? The uh, famous Christian philosopher Francis Schaeffer is kind of well known for just saying this How then shall we live? In light of the truth of what Christ has done for us already, and that he's going to heaven to prepare a place for us. And in light of the fact that the Bible testifies that he's going to come back, he's going to judge the world, he's going to set things right, he's going to prepare a place for us, and here it is in descriptive, described in, in Revelation. How do we live? This is the most important question. It's not enough just to know the truth. It's not enough just to, to know Bible verses. It's not enough to have the right theology. Unless those Bible verses and theology impact us and change us. Because probably the scariest thing as I think about this passage is this. People will experience, during the millennial kingdom, they will experience Christ. They will see him clearer than we see him now. And they will experience that, know that, and will choose to follow Satan. That's a scary thought to me. Will I be deceived? And it causes me to question and work through my salvation a lot. Because I don't want to be on the wrong side. And I hope your desire is for that as well. I didn't want to do this to scare you. I wanted to do this because too often we, we focus. And, and it's because we have these incredible times and periods, where events that happen, we, we remember the incarnation. We just came off of Christmas. We just came off of remembering Jesus coming down. God becoming flesh. God becoming man. And now we turn our eyes to Easter because we start thinking about the incredible sacrifice he paid when he didn't have to pay anything. He was perfect. Sin and death had no hold on Christ. And we love those because it reminds us of who Jesus is and what he gave up for us. But please do not forget, he's coming again. He is coming again. And our lives, he wants us to live lives that honor and glorify him. You know, if you've got family around you, I just want to give you a couple minutes. And, and I want you to think about this, okay? Okay. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That day of visitation is that a person becomes a Christian. When they look at you, they, they think awful things about you. But as you live your life, as you share with them, as you, you love them, they come to a place where they, they accept and believe Jesus is the Lord and Savior. And they're transformed by God's work, but God using you. 
with your families. I just want you to think through this. How am I supposed to live? How do I live a life like this? That's attractive. That's, that's drawing people to Christ. That in the midst of being surrounded by people who may think terrible things about me and my God, that in the end, they would turn to Jesus. I just want to give you a couple minutes. And, and I know there's... <laughs> Mike's alone. Sorry, Mike. Um, <laughs> but even just if you're alone, just spend some time in prayer. But if you got kids, talk about that a little. Parents, how do you live out your faith in your workplace? I know it's, uh, and I just want to encourage you, have these conversations. Make these part of your life. Um, just encourage you in that. Kids, ask questions. If you don't understand something in the Bible, ask questions. And parents, then just seek it out with them. Seek it out with them. Pray with it. Pray about it with them and, and work through it with them. Um, my favorite football team is the Chicago Bears. And 1985 was a great year, right, Jim? Right? Um, and I remember when they released the Super Bowl shuffle. I was like 14. And it didn't dawn on me. They released that on December 3rd. They still had like five games left before the playoffs and before the Super Bowl. There was no guarantee they were going to make the Super Bowl. And two days before, they had just lost the only game of that season. They didn't know that then. They lost their first game against Miami. And two days after that, they're releasing a song about how they're going to shuffle and win the Super Bowl. Kind of arrogant, right? But they had faith. They had belief, right? They truly believed they were going to do it. And all they could put their faith in was themselves. That's what they had their faith in. Guys, our faith is in something much greater than ourselves. Our faith is in the risen Savior who's already done amazing things. What's this to him? He's coming back. And for those of us who are his, it's going to be awesome. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we look forward to your coming. We anticipate your coming. We anticipate your return. When you will set things right, when you will win the victory, the final battle will be fought and you with words, with, with that sword from your mouth will conquer and then when Satan is released, fire, God, you will send that fire and win the battle. We just entrust in you. We put our lives and entrust our lives to you, knowing that you are greater. You're our Savior and Lord. We praise your name. We praise you for your goodness and love, but also your power and your authority. Father, we anticipate and wait for your coming. And in the midst of that, God, may we live lives that honor and glorify you, that worship you, and that reap a harvest of people coming to know you as their Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.